We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So this is my show and tell. Uh, every single cell in our body is packaged with my toolkit, which is DNA. And uh, we have two types of DNA that carries the blueprints that we all walk with. Uh, and I know to this audience, this is like kindergarten school, but I'm showing this to remind us that I'm gonna talk about uh, two different types of inheritance. The nuclear DNA, which is, uh, the makes up the chromosomes that undergoes mixing at cell division or recombination. Um, that is now why I am at this height and at this size. You heard about brain size and height and weight, etc. Well, I am your show and tell for all of that today. In addition, Small is packaged and dangerous. We have the mitochondrion that has its own unique set of DNA, which over evolution has uh, come to carry yet another uh, remnant of DNA in every cell. Now, the reason why the mitochondrial DNA is, is of use is that it is strictly maternally inherited and carries a trajectory of our maternal inheritance. So, so these are my two uh, show and tell uh, sources of information. And so that I don't exclude the males in the audience. Yes, you have that little uh, thing there, uh, the Y chromosome. Well, genomic inheritance is, is known to all of us. Uh, we get half our chromosomes from each of our parents and uh, they from their parents before, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so, um, with respect to mitochondrial DNA, we would be able to track what both sons and daughters got from mother, from maternal grandmother, and great grandmother, and so on, and so on, and so on. In males who have the Y chromosome, we have the equivalent mechanism to trace paternal heritage. But of course, the, the, the uh, nuclear DNA carries the uh, uh, contributions from both parental sides. And if you go back uh, one, two, three generations, you have eight people who potentially contribute to your ancestry. And if you want to go back 20 generations, two to the power 20 would have co contributed to your total genomic information, but you'll still have a single maternal ancestor. And it was just by chance that I chose for my title, So Where Do We Come From? Not knowing that that is among the questions that, that Carter looks at. Uh, and the reason I chose that was about 15 years ago, I was involved in a documentary that was produced uh, in South Africa by one of the uh, TV networks by the same name. And in that we showed peace a whole bunch of local people transcending politics, sport, and all sorts of uh, disciplines. And, and we did their genetic ancestry tests and made a story out of it. 
Um, and I was going to show you some clips from that, but it would have eaten into my limited time that I had. But in any event, you've heard about uh, fossils, you've heard about tools, you've seen a little bit about culture, and basically those subdisciplines allow us to track uh, from the past and build up to the present. The genetic toolkit is the reverse. We study the DNA found in living people and we reconstruct the changes over time and for this demonstration, I'm using mitochondrial DNA, which is only transmitted through uh, the mother line to daughters, and only daughters will pass it on. And the sexy thing about this DNA is that it does not shuffle or recombine. So you have a mechanism and, an, and a valuable tool to reconstruct the history of change over time to some point back in the past. And if I were to demonstrate this with a little bit more of a cartoon, so if we were to take uh, mitochondrial DNA, we'd be able to link it to some point back in the past. We call that the most recent common ancestor for mitochondrial DNA. And the reason why I dislike the use of the terminolo terminology mitochondrial Eve, it gives a sense that the most recent common ancestor was the only female present in that time zone which is not the case. So, but in reconstructing the lineages found in living people, the divergent lines kind of coalesce or come together at a common point some in the distance past dated to between 150 and 200,000 years ago. Now, mitochondrial DNA was made famous by the seminal paper by uh, Becky Kahn, Mark Stoneking, and Alan Wilson, where they used mitochondrial DNA. And in, in, in the uh, 80s, we didn't have the sophisticated technology of polymerase chain reaction to, to make lots of copies of DNA from small amounts. These authors went out, collected placenta, which was a rich source of DNA, extracted the DNA, cut it up with uh, little protein tools called restriction enzymes, and created these maps. And what they found was when they looked at the relationships of all the different patterns that made up the lineages, one particular branch was exclusively containing individuals from Africa. And as you went towards the rest of the tree, drawn here as the famous horseshoe-shaped tree, uh, one found that in the, the shallower parts of the tree, individuals from Europe and Asia were positioned. So this kind of uh, steer-headed was uh, the out of Africa theory concerning modern human origins. It wasn't without controversy. There were many, many side chirps around this, uh, um, uh, criticizing the technique for the dating methodology and so on, but that's a long story. But several other types of studies started to come to the fore, and what was now becoming more and more apparent was that as you went further away from Africa, and you know, for our colleagues from East Africa, that's seen as the center of the evolution of, of our species, as you went further away from Africa, the amount of genetic diversity was becoming more and more reduced. And this was further evidence that uh, our species originated in Africa. I don't think the world was still ready for this because, uh, I mean, just think about it. You know, all the social issues going on about coming from Africa, uh, and that's like another five lectures to go, but I will spare you that. Nonetheless, as the technology started to improve and we've gone from restriction mapping to the advent of the introduction of polymerase chain reaction, uh, better techniques for genetic sequencing, and now we can do whole genome sequencing. The, the, the culmination of the Human Genome Project gave, gave us scientists you know, an open era of asking questions and trying to resolve that uh, through, through uh, analysis, et cetera. And so some uh, colleagues uh, uh, sequenced a few individuals from uh, their whole genome sequences from Southern Africa. It was the first 
sequences from the Southern African region, and included among those individuals, there were four people from Namibia who were San, and our famous Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And, um, and so when we got the results from there, all individuals with respect to their mitochondrial DNA had similar patterns to that of the San and the Khoi, the indigenous people from Southern Africa. And that is what made the news. Even um, Oprah Winfrey's show and all, all the, the news bulletins were talking about uh, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu being part and parcel of ancestry to the first people. This was a whole genome sequence. The mitochondria is yet but a small component of it. And, but the world was talking about the mitochondrial uh, ge genetic study showing linkage of Archbishop Desmond Tutu to that of the sun. Now, what the study brought out was quite an interesting observation. Using the x-axis in uh, a plot of um, uh, summarizing all of the data collectively, each individual in a pairwise fashion, you saw that there was one cluster uh, that was associated with with African people from the Niger-Congo language family, and there was another cluster that contained those four San individuals, and those people from the European regions, can you see it, just clustered into like one spot. So immediately you can see, just with f a few sequences, the vastness and the diversity present in Africa. And if you were wanting to a magnified view of that, if you just looked at the African individual, once again, you saw this increased diversity. But there's something emerging from here, that people from different parts of the continent, their genetic structure was seemingly different. And you know, we had theories about multi-regional theory concerning all human origins, and people started to talk about asking the question, about evolution in Africa. And so already we're seeing there's spe specific patterns in the southern part, in the western part, and uh, in people who were migrant to the southern part, similar to that in the wider part of Africa, namely people who are speaking Bantu languages. And so my group has been for over three decades now, I, I have been in this business, from the very beginnings when DNA technology kind of hit the world and we picked it up in South Africa almost like a backlash 10 years later. Um, and so I came into the business when we were still very using very um, um, simple techniques to the point of where you can do whole genome sequencing now. And over the years through my predecessor, Professor Trevor Jenkins, uh, we've been interested in the history of peoples of Africa and um, we have always tried to do it in a holistic way, using genetics as our tool, but also engaging with colleagues from other disciplines, linguistics, archaeology, paleontology, history, and anthropology. And so I'm a bit of an apprentice of all of that and consider myself more a molecular anthropologist than a hardcore geneticist because I'm interested in these sorts of questions. In any event, I had a very bright uh, PhD student, uh, Karina Schliebusch, who was interested in following up on some of the uh, studies we were doing among the Khoi and the San populations. Uh, she's now doing uh, amazing work with Matthias uh, Jacobson in Sweden. And last week I had the privilege of being at a meeting there in Sweden where they brought together the world's best working in the disciplines of linguistics, uh, archaeology, and genetics to talk about the, the, the diversity in Africa. And while we present a very simplistic overview here, uh, the more recent work is actually very dynamic. There are lots and lots of debates. And, 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 and the, the thing that was most mind-boggling was that there are researchers in, in France now modeling linguistics, archaeology, and genetic data uh, collectively to kind of get a deeper vision of the past. In any event, we did some SNP chip technology 
moving away from just mitochondria and Y chromosome that we'd been busy with for a while. And what we found was that the first branch in the human tree with this kind of genomic data contain populations that were exclusively Khoi and San speaking peoples. They had genetic information greater than 100,000 years. And the first time there was a divergence from that major branch was as recent as 45,000 years ago, where we see some splits in populations from Central Africa, Eastern Africa, and West Africa. So that was quite a, a, a major observation. We were not the only ones who, who made that uh, observation. Others have done so as well. Now, this is a scary slide, but just allow me to walk you through it. Um, this, this is another analysis that people do with genomic data. It's called structure. And basically what they're doing is, is looking at each individual. So if we have 500 individuals in our sample, each individual is a data point across uh, from left to right, uh, belonging to that branch where their, their sample is placed. And it's amount of admixture. Okay? So there are no pure populations. Let's just get that first fact out of the way. There are no pure populations. People seem to think when you do admixture mapping, you're starting with two pure populations and then you're blending. No, we are mongrelized ahead of that. And so now when you, when you look across using structure, it identifies this different genetic backgrounds. And all I want for you to see that if you go with the green being West Africa, the blue Central Africa, and the red, the Southern African Khoi and San, if you look from left to right, you can see different color structural patterns. And so this is what is going on in Africa. There's a deep structure of genetic patterns of difference across the populations on the African continent. And if I were to just summarize that by a very, very nice review written by Karina Schliebusch and Matthias Jacobson published last year, then you would see a summary of what we've seen before with a difference. What has now happened is by looking at some ancient DNA samples, both in South Africa and in Central Africa, in studies published by different uh, authors, they've now pushed that convergence point of dating uh, the common ancestry in Africa beyond 150 to around 300,000. And that is in keeping with some of the fossil evidence that's come from Flores Bud as well. So when you now look at that genetic pattern I pre presented earlier and you condense it all together, we see once again on a, one branch the Khoi and the San populations, Central Africans, West Africans, and East Africans. And a small branch out of that represents what's come out of Africa. So you can see now why Africa is every expedition, expeditioner's paradise. Because if you want to do biomedical research, and if you do not understand what's come out of Africa, you might as well pack your bags and go to the beach because <laughs> this is what you need to understand. And so, so we feel very privileged to be in that region, but it is also quite difficult because while I may sound very enthusiastic about it, of course, we have to also work with all the ethical, legal, and social issues that come with working with human subjects. Now, if I were to just very quickly summarize graphically uh, in keeping with a, a map of where those genetic patterns are seen, you see we also have many gaps. So scientists are bus busy collecting samples to try to fill up those gaps, and the data is out there. It's just coming in, uh, uh, in, into the public domain now. So what we see in Africa is very deep history. What my colleagues ahead of me have been talking about is that very, very deep history. But how far back do we take the genetics in Africa is, is unlike in Europe where we've got samples from Neanderthals from 45,000 years ago. If uh, some of the archeologists and paleontologists 
will allow the scientists to touch their specimens from Africa, maybe we could go deeper. We, we, we did publish a paper two years ago about specimens dating to four, just over 2,000 years ago to try to understand what would have been the genetic um, structure of individuals pre the migration of people speaking Bantu languages to the south. And that paper was published and um, I, I didn't want to bring it here because I would have taken 20 minutes to explain. So we have very deep structure we have migrations associated with the spread of Bantu languages from West Africa into Southern Africa in the time period spanning about three to 5,000 years. And then we have a very interesting pattern with the advent of pastoralism as uh, um, people started to acquire cattle and move to the South, the Khoi who we've sampled in uh, Namibia carry a genetic pattern Link with lactase persistence, the ability to consume cow milk, similar to that found in the Maasai in Kenya. So that's another very, very interesting adaptive trait that has come into the southern part of Africa. Now, for those of you who've been following this literature, you know that people in Europe have different genetic markers that allow them to process uh, or co to consume milk. But in Africa, different genes. So to the same cultural uh, trait, different genes have been adapted for. And so, so in addition to that sort of tracking of mobility, we've also had in input from Europe and Asia into the African continent at different times. So not only did Africa give the rest of the world its genetics, those individuals who were in exile, some have returned, like me. <laughs> so a couple years ago, um, as I started to engage with colleagues outside of my discipline to, to, to make sense of genetics, I would go to archaeological meetings and you know, engage with other colleagues. And it became very apparent that even among our academics, we were talking across each other. I mean, I would get people calling me up and say, well, if you were to go to a particular gravesite uh, where skeletal remains were found, can you tell us if those were slaves brought from Zimbabwe buried there? And so I would ask, well, did you think that Zimbabweans had a different genetic pattern to other Africans. So, so, so we were talking across understanding each other. And so I was privileged to have hosted a, a conference in South Africa uh, where we invited multidisciplinary uh, colleagues from within the country and overseas to participate. And I was able to edit a book, one of the first on the prehistory of Africa where it was a collection of bringing together this kind of interdisciplinary dialogue. And we've progressed to, to being able to talk a little bit more now, so much so that all of our genetic studies has at least an anthropologist or a historian or an anthropologist associated with it. Colleagues, the biggest story is about translation of science. When we sit in our little ivory towers and we communicate just with our peers, we forget that the individuals that we need to serve are the general public. And so, so in my own field work, having to work outside of the ivory towers of university boundaries, you, you really, really get acculturated into what society is all about. And, and fortunately for me, there's always a tree somewhere, and I would use the metaphor of a tree to talk about all living people being a leaf on the tree and your connection through branches to the common trunk is actually the history of how your DNA links to the common trunk. It has the opportunity to bring people together to realize that we are one species, uh, bringing human solidarity into the dialogue and also having the ability to tell stories. And so I created with a company called Jive Media in South Africa, some of these tools where we're telling stories. And as you tell the story, here the grandmother, the gogo, is telling her family how her people have come to be where they are. That's oral history. 
We cultural anthropologists collect information on oral history. And, and we intertwine the story into this cartoon where um, one of the individuals has been to university and he's had a genetic ancestry test. And so the young buck, the curious little guy, wants to know all about it. And so in unfolding the story with different cartoons, we now unpack what a genetic ancestry test is. Now, because that is what I was interested in, we use it as an opportunity because lots and lots of people are doing my medical research in the country. And that whole issue of informed consent is not only about the signature, that informed part is actually very powerful. And so we try to have tools to be able to take the jargon out of the conversation and bring in a visual to help the process. So I just wanted to put that little punt in and to say that, that the science that we do could not stay out of the public domain. It very quickly crept in with opportunities to engage the public. People demanded to have genetic ancestry tests. And so we had to set it up and part of that documentary uh, I even was privileged to have the, had the opportunity of testing former President Nelson Mandela. And uh, his mitochondrial DNA was present on this branch. So this is my famous tree, which is actually adapted from the, the, the tree that was published uh, by Behar et al. in a schematic way so that we could show, show how the different branches are related. All the branches with green circles carry mitochondrial lineages commonly found in Africa. And then as you come out of Africa, the M branch is seen in the Indian subcontinent and to, into the Americas. And through the N, we see most of the branches that are found in Europe and some in Asia called Eurasian lineages. So, so this is uh, a summary of the mitochondrial DNA patterns that exist in living, living humans today. So, so uh, uh, former President Nelson Mandela's lineage was found on this branch L0, which is the one found most commonly among Khoi and San. And believe it or not, uh, having now done research in various communities, one of the things I've tried to do is take back a result, a mitochondrial and Y chromosome result, to individuals so that they don't feel that parachute type of science that you know you go in, you take the samples and you go back, go out and never to be seen again. So we go back giving them those results. And, um, and so now some other unique thing has come about. People are now calling me up almost on a daily basis to have their genetic ancestry test done because in some uh, areas they've been told that if you have your genetic test, it will be your certificate uh, to tell you whether you are San or not. And in that way, you may be able to claim land in the whole land claim issue that's going on. So what, what started off as a very uh, complementary way of keeping the relationship going between the science and the communities, uh, it's now coming back where there's opportunistic uh, aspects being brought into it. So one of the, the second fact, the first one was that we are not pure populations. The second fact that you must go away with is that a genetic ancestry test does not tell you anything about your identity. As you sit here, you, you have myriads of uh, identities. Huh? But no genetic test could define any one of those. So that's the second thing I like to emphasize to people, that genetic ancestry is not equal to identity. Identity is complex, it's multifaceted, and it's fluid. Your genetic ancestry is the unbiased record of your genetic heritage going back in time. So colleagues, uh, genetics, that was just uh, genetics 101 or, or genetics 0.05. Um, has been a very, very useful tool to try to track movements of people around the globe. Not only have we used mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA to kind of plot the phylogeography of, of uh, the human journey, 
the advent of whole genome sequencing and various types of analysis with that data now is refining uh, theories concerning our origins. Uh, ancient DNA has allowed a deeper view into the past, and I don't have time to talk about those components, uh, but it is another way of gaining insights into questions that we would otherwise not have had opportunities for. So in closing, I first of all want to acknowledge uh, with deep gratitude the Carter um, Institute for, for this opportunity to be here. Uh, participants who obviously make us who we are in our careers, uh, various collaborators and funders, and I have to give a punt wearing the cap of my new role as the Executive Officer of the Academy of Science, is that science should be done to promote and advance science, evidence-based science in serving society. Then there's science for society, and of course, science for policy. So the next time you venture into your science world, just try to deposit a few kodos in each of these three boxes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to share my opinion on the, this special topic, because in the last few years, you might have heard repeatedly about claims made the earliest of this, the earliest of this, but my discussion is going to be focusing on the earliest homo sapien claims by, by people, by different researchers. Assessing claims of the earliest homo sapiens needs first to evaluate a series of recent discoveries and interpretations that figure prominently in any current understanding of Pleistocene human evolution. For this, we need to have the geochronological position of the fossils securely determined. Whenever somebody says that he found the earliest Homo sapien, the first thing that you, we have to see is whether the dating was properly done. The geochronology is really there. Then after that, what we have to do is according to La Cruz et al., the modern human face is distinct. That means what we have to do first is we have to define what we are trying to say the earliest whatever Homo sapien. How do we define Homo sapien? Just you know, to use the recent literature, according to La Cruz et al., 2019, the modern human face is distinct from that of the earliest hominid species in several important ways, including the following. One, it is relatively small, the face is relatively small and then projecting, as you can see it. The face is very, very small, high, you know, big head, but small face. Second, it shows a depression, what we call the canine fossa. This is the depression. Especially the modern human face has this special depression. Okay? Below the orbit. Third thing, I'm trying to limit my, my description of Homo sapiens. Just using certain features, and we try to evaluate. We can, we, we can use a whole suite of morphology or features. But for, for the purpose of my talk, I want to limit it just to the face and small, small regions. It lacks a pronounced supraorbital torus. What we call the supraorbital is just the eyebrow region. Homo sapiens, like us, don't have a huge brow ridge above our eyes. These features do not appear all at once in the fossil record but crucial elements are already in place among the earliest representatives of Homo sapien lineages. This presentation will focus on the hominid fossils. I'm using hominids just only for those who are bipedal. My hominid definition does not include chimps and gorillas. 
I'm talking only about the bipedal ones. Okay? Because the recent classification used hominin. I'm not using hominin, I'm using hominid. Hominid is bipedal for me. Okay? This presentation will focus on, the, on those hominid fossils in, Afri in Africa ranging between 1 million years and 150,000 million years, uh, thousand years. The reason why I do that is, one, they have to be, they have to have good stratigraphic hygiene. I use the word hygiene because usually it is, it's a mess. They have to be clean. You have to know exactly where they came from. This is a word I borrowed from Miller 2008, which is a very important word. And the other thing is a reasonably acceptable age estimate. Because the age range of some of the fossils that we are dealing with these days is just enormous. But we prefer a certain age. Sometimes we prefer. It's not because that it's, it, it's, that's the age that is the preferred age, which is scientifically unacceptable. Third, complete enough to make a morphological observation to assess their taxonomic affinity. So there are so many fragments of bones, of you know, hominid bones, ranging between one million years and 150,000 years, but most of them are just bits and pieces. So to make this assessment, I really want to use only those who, who do have mostly face, face included, and the other parts. So when, when, you, when I choose that, there are so few in Africa, very few. I used as a base, as a one million base level, I used the fossil that my colleagues and myself found from Mirlawash, Dhaka because I am 100% sure about its stra stratigraphic hygiene. It is clearly found from one million years ago based on argon-argon dates, and the stratigraphy is clearly labeled. So with this, with this understanding between one million and 150,000 years ago, within the lineage in Africa, in the African landscape, there were hominids, that evolved from Homo erectus, or whatever you call Homo erectus. Some people prefer that. There are hominids of the, of the lineage. These different populations of hominids evolved incrementally through time. Incrementally through time. That means they add features every time. adding features that lead towards Homo sapiens. The advanced features may not be manifested in all populations at once, but the Homo sapien, thought Homo sapienization of the lineage has continued through time. So I, I, I see the, uh, the lineage it's not, didn't appear, meaning the, 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 the Homo sapien package did not appear at once. It is a process. It, it, it increases characters through time. That's what I see in the fossil record. Then my base, the, the top, is what I used is Homo sapien adulto. This is another one which I'm 100% sure about its stratigraphic hygiene, which is 150, between 150 and 160,000 years boundary, and the age is undisputable. So the morphology, it has a clear homo sapien morphology, which we'll go through it later. So the homo sapien lineage may have originated around 500,000 years ago or earlier. So using this, their features, the hominids may be treated in three groups or stages, early, middle, and late stage. This is an arbitrary boundary that I, I try to break them. The earliest, from the complete ones, which is part of the face, 
which is the morphological feature that we uh, that were manifested early in the lineage is from a landsfontaine, Saldana. The age between 700 to 400,000 years ago, based on fauna, recently, recent uh, fauna work suggested older than 600,000, maybe from 600 to 1 million. Brow ridge is, this is what we call the brow ridge. The brow ridge is very thick and undifferentiated. Undifferentiated means in Homo sapiens, the middle part, which we call the superciliary part, is a little bit thick, and the lateral part is thin. But in Fontaine or Saldana, it's thick mediolaterally, which is a very primitive feature. The occipital torus is not strong, and that is common to all Africans. African, even African Homo erectus, they all have similar kind of, so we cannot use it. But what else do we use? The frontal is less constricted. This is the beginning of Homo sapienization. The frontal part, this part, is not constricted. In the earlier parts, in the earlier groups in Homo erectus, this is, this, the lateral part of the most lateral edge of the brow ridge is very wide compared to the frontal. But in this Elan's Fontaine, the frontal is not very constricted. It's even less constricted even than that of Broken Hill. This feature is more advanced than Homo erectus. This is the beginning. And the cranial capacity is 1,250 cc is much bigger than Homo erectus, much bigger than Homo erectus. That means brain expansion has started. This is a trend going towards Homo sapiens. Okay, then the associated tools, still Achillean. That is the kind of tools that we have been seeing with Homo erectus. Let's go to the next group. This is Bodo. Bodo is skull found in the middle Awash, in the area that I have work with, I've been working in the last 30 years, age 600,000, based on Argonardon dating. Cranial capacity is exactly the same as Elan's Fontaine or Saldana, 1,250 cc, much bigger than Homo erectus. The Homo erectus is under 1,000 cc. That means the brain has started expanding. Expanding, which is a direction that we see going towards Homo sapiens. High and arched temporal scoma. When you see this, this region, in Homo erectus, it's like, it forms like almost like a straight line. But in these guys, it forms like an arch. It's an, ad, an advanced morphology. Supraorbital torus differentiated, meaning the lateral part is thin and the medial part is thick. This is a kind of morphology that we see in Homo sapiens. So that means it's, they are adding morphology to, you know, going towards Homo sapiens. The associated tools are Acheulean, like Homo erectus. But the morphology is changing. Unfortunately, the, the occipital part is not preserved. What about broken here? Age, unknown. We don't know. Klein correlated the fauna of Olduvai, upper bed two through bed four. That age range is between 1.78 to 490,000. You can put it anywhere. So, but the temporal scoma is arched, like, like Bodo. It's an advanced Homo sapien kind of Homo sapienization that we see. The upper scale of the occipital, which is this one, is relative to the lower scale, is big. That is also an advanced feature. Frontal is transversally expanded. This is what we call the frontal. Unfortunately, it's still primitive because it doesn't have a forehead. We have a forehead, which makes us different from Homo erectus. But this guy, even though it has a big brain, but no frontal yet, but still 
transversally expanded. It's big. It's a homo sapienization that we call. A cranial capacity is a little bit bigger than Bodo and Saldana. Now you can see the brain keeps expanding. The other features are not there. What about Ndutu from Tanzania, from Ndutu beds? Age estimates, about 400,000 years old. See discussion in Millard, there are so many discussions about the age, but about the age range is about 400,000. What is important about this is cranial capacity, and so it is small, maybe a, a female, because there is a sexual dimorphism between males and females. One, 1,100 cc, looks smaller than Bodo, Broken Hill, and Saldana, but it has more homo sapien features than them. The occipital is not flexed, you can see it from here. It's an open occipital. In Homo erectus, it is flexed, but this one is really open. Especially the backside is almost vertical. Has a post canine fossa, something that we have never seen before, either in Bodo, Saldana, or Broken Hill. It is this part. We Homo sapiens have a depression right here, which we called the post canine fossa. That is a Homo sapien character at that stage. The associative tools, still Acheulean. So the brain size is much more than Homo erectus. The occipital has changed towards Homo, sapi homo sapiens, vertical occipital, so the upper scale. Canine fossa, the most important part is developed. And, and the torus is still thick. It shows a little bit of differentiation, but still the lateral part is very thick. It's a mosaic evolution that we, we see in these groups. What about LH18, Nigaloba, again from Tanzania, from the Nigaloba beds. The age, hey, 1987 reported age of the fossil for LH18 in the marker tuff, probably greater than 128, 29,000 to greater 132,000, certainly less than 990,000. Millard, 2008, reported an age less than 490,000. Now you can see how messy the dating is. My assumption is an age of 400,000, this is just an assumption, maybe an age of 400,000 may be acceptable. Cranial capacity? 1,367, it's big cranial capacity. Occipital, you can see the back of the skull, open with no torus. That is also an advanced feature. post canine fossa is visible, like the one I showed you in Dutu, it has a post canine fossa which is also present in modern Homo sapiens, like us. Okay, what about floor spot? from South Africa. Based on ESR dates, the age's best estimate is 329 to about 189,000 years, similar in 2008. Has a canine fossa, look at this, this depression, it's called the canine fossa. Short face, typical for Homo sapiens, but the earlier forms, especially in the globa, the face is still big even though it has canine fossa. That means everything did not come together. Everything did not come together. Okay, the frontal is very steep, has developed a frontal, steep frontal, a forehead. The anterior surface of zygomatic forms 90 degrees. This one is 90 degrees, that is typical Homo sapien. What about Jebel Urhard? Long and low cranium, Continuously thick brow ridge, these are primitive morphologies. Cranial capacity is 1,450 cc. It's more than average, even for modern humans. <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. Convex frontal, but still low. Convex frontal, still low. Brow ridge is thick mediolaterally, which is very primitive. Occipital, moderately angled. Short face. The anterior surface of the zygomatic forms 90 degrees, which is typical Homo sapien. 
the dates of Jabal Irhad evolved from it's an evolution of dates, now you can see. When it, when it was first published, it was 40,000 years old, 1968. Then 160,000 in 1991, and 300,000 in 2017. This is the evolution of dates. I suggest to redate other sites like Florsbad and others, for whatever words it may be. If we redate, they may also evolve in that direction. What about Omo? The Omo Kibish skulls, there are two different kinds of skulls. This is Omo 1, and this one is Omo 2. Omo 1 is very advanced. Typical Homo sapien. Steep frontal, except morphology, very Homo sapien-like. Omo 2 is very archaic in occipital septum and frontal profile. They may not belong to the same group of evolutionary status. Omo2 is less advanced and may belong to ancestral lineage of Omo1. It may belong to a different contemporary, pop cont contemporary populations. It may, if they, if they are from the same horizon. Based on taphonomic evidence, they may not be contemporaneous. Even though they are published as to be as contemporaneous, for interpretation, it's misleading. If, they, if, we, if we can confirm it, yeah, it's, a, it's an evidence by itself for two different populations, one advanced population, the other primitive population to live side by side. But based on our observation, Omo2 is very, very primitive. You can see it's an isolated surface find, no associated archaeology like Omo1. Cranium is low and massive, very low. You can see the, the frontal is very flat and the occipital is very flexed, unlike OMO1. Frontal is low, weakly killed, a strongly angled occipital. Cranial capacity is very big, typical Homo sapien type. Broad and constricted frontal. Parietal is bulged and expanded. And it was a surface find, not associated stone tools. So we think, based on this evidence that we observed on the fossil, Notes, the polished, eroded supraorbitals. They are polished and eroded. And the polish is also on the temporal surface. So they are highly polished. So these features may suggest hydraulic transportation of the skull by Paleo Omo River or its tributaries. So I think they are not contemporaneous. And this is a very good information to take into consideration. Hair top, let's see. Small face, tucked under the brain case. Small face, tucked under the brain case. No projecting mid face, the mid face not projecting. It's only the lower part of the face looks a little bit projection. It's a very, you know, kind of primitive character. Anterior surface of the zygomatic, this area, forms a vertical orientation. This vertical orientation, typical of Homo, Homo sapien, has a post canine fossa, that is something you have seen, Nudutu, and Flores bud, and Jebel your heart. Okay? Inferior border of zygomatic joints, 90 degrees, typical of Homo sapien. A steep frontal, that is major mark of Homo sapiens, steep frontal. Brow ridge is differentiated into medial and lateral. The lateral part is thin, and the medial part is thick. It's typical of Homo sapien. Occipital is open and flexed. Long vault, but still has some primitive characters. So what do we learn from the Middle Pleistocene fossil record in Africa? The Homo sapien lineage emerged early, maybe by 500,000 years ago. And earlier groups between 500,000 and 1 million years ago, Daka and Buya, between those times, may represent the last common ancestor with the Neanderthals. The change observers through time includes brain expansion that we have seen from Saldana time, parietal bulging, as we observed also at Saldana time, occipital less flexed, that is, that we have seen in, at least by uh, Broken Hill, facial profile advanced and small, and smaller, that is what we see next by Nudutu time, Brain getting bigger and frontal keeps 
frontal convex but still low, that is what we see in Jebeli Hard, brow ridge reducing, occipital more open. A steep frontal, smaller face, that is a third stage that we have seen. This is what we see in Idalto and still with some primitive features. Then, when we go, the first stage, there is one stage, that's the brain expansion that we have started in the earlier parts, and the second stage, then we have seen a little bit of facial change, like the first emergence of the facial morphology developing post canine fossa, and the third stage, superior expansion and lateral part of the uh, brow ridge thinning. This is the sequence that we have seen through time. Then, at which stage of the lineage do we claim the earliest homo sapien status for a hominid? It's unfortunate. We use that terminology, and I think it is misleading. So, it is an arbitrary term that we use the earliest, and the easiest thing to do is we find a homo sapien at 160,000, we find a homo sapien at 400,000, but the earliest is a misleading terminology, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you.